bespoke radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. All right. Good evening, Fade to Black. How you doing? Today is Monday, September 11th, 2023. Wow. Just saying that date, just saying it. Today is Monday, September 11th, 2023, 22 years ago. And uh, there you go. Uh, I'll I'll circle back to that in just a second. But uh, it's going to be a great show tonight and uh, great shows this week. I want to remind everybody that uh, Thursday we are off air. Um, I've got uh, some taping that I have to do. And uh, so I will be doing that this weekend. And it starts on Thursday. So that's uh, the schedule uh, for this week. And we're going to do an AMA on Wednesday night. And, uh, you know, oddly enough, uh, when we do AMAs, uh, especially lately, they've been impromptu, you know, technical reasons or whatever. And we do an emergency AMA. This time around, uh, my producer uh, here, Michelle, she just scheduled the AMA. (laughs) I'm looking at the... Looking at the calendar, I'm like, wow, okay, so uh, Michelle's scheduling the AMAs now, and I thought that that was pretty awesome. So we're going to do that on uh, Wednesday night. Uh, we've got a great uh, week in front of us. Uh, tonight, Marco Vegato is here. We're going to be talking about lost civilizations, and he was last with us. Uh, we were talking about Atlantis and his new book. Um, And he is back with us tonight. Help support the show by getting your Fade to Black t-shirts. You can get one. We have two designs, not one. We have two. Uh, Both are shipping. And uh, like I said earlier today, uh, uh, there's an auction happening at the end of the week. (laughs) Oh, man. No, uh, I, I kid. I kid. I kid, but it would take about 10,000 shirts just to put in the first bid on that Star Wars X-Wing fighter. Okay. Um, I wanted to say this about today before I bring in Marco. It is September 11th, and earlier on the news, I had said, uh, because it was you know, it was part of the news uh, today, that that morning um, I had been... For a number of years up to that point, uh, well, and continued after, I slept with the TV on and the lights on. I had my own reasons for doing that. And the TV was on uh, that uh, morning. And it it just was the beginning of one of the most surreal times uh, in the world, uh, not only for for me personally, but for everybody. And I was talking to my mom, my stepmom, uh, Sharon, over the weekend, and, uh, you know, just checking in with her. And she reminded me, and it is something that contributed to uh, that whole thing. It was such a surreal time uh, for all of us. And and for me personally, um, my, her dad, uh, my, my step grandfather, my grandfather, uh, had gone into the hospital in South Bend. She was in Columbus with the family at the time and was planning on flying up, uh, to South Bend. And then nine 11 happened and, and that stopped everything. But anyway, he passed away. He, he saw nine 11 happen. Uh, while he was in the hospital, he passed away a few days later. That uh, he, he had a he had a bad heart, man. He had like I don't know how many open heart surgeries and bypasses and things up to that point, and uh, uh, it was just his time. But that that trauma uh, for me personally, Bob was a a really really cool guy, and. And then what happened for the next uh, months after that, but certainly 30 days 
or so of watching New York uh, uh, try to recover from this and the stoppage of programming, it, you know, whatever David Letterman and, and 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 that first day. This is what I wanted to share with you. The crazy part for me, and yes, the buildings, you know, the World Trade Center and Seven and all that came down, but it was the crowds of people trying to get out of Manhattan, crossing the bridges and trying to get on ferries and doing everything they could to get away. That just, you know, we're talking about millions of people. It was just a surreal time. And September 11th, I know for our generation and those that went through it, uh, we're not going to forget that. And we now know, I mean, the significance of uh, December 7th and Pearl Harbor Day, uh, today, our generations, you know, we weren't around for that. And we, you know, it was a date that we were constantly reminded of, but we didn't go through it. But for those of us that went through September 11th, what will it be like in the generations uh, down the road? You know, September 11th, September 11th. And they will have to listen to people like myself and you that went through it, you know, where you were that day and and the trauma that we felt. So uh, here we go. It's going to be a great show tonight. I just wanted to share that with everybody. I'm not going to go you know, and, and just be happy, smiley guy uh, on a day like today. I think that we should all just uh, just step back and remember, you know, over 3,000 people died that day. And uh, we just need to just, just stop and be thankful for where we are, who we are, and our friends and family and, and everything that is around us. Okay, so with that, let's escape a little bit. Now that I'm letting you know. I haven't forgotten. All right. Tonight, Marco Vagato is with us. We are going to be discussing the lost civilizations of Mexico and Central America. That and a whole lot more tonight. Marco has spent the last 15 years researching the question of origins of civilizations around the world. He is the author of The Empires of Atlantis, published by Inner Traditions, and a frequent contributor to various print and online journals. He holds degrees from Milan's Bocconi uh, University and an MBA from Harvard Business School. Check that. Uh, yes, he is a native of a native of Italy, and he lives and works in Mexico City. He is the founder and president of the ARX Association for Archaeological Research and Exploration, and that and so much more. Yes, he does TV. He does the podcast. He does the documentaries, and all of his websites are below and over on uh, our social media. I would like to welcome back to Fade to Black. Uh, man, this camera is blocking that. Oh, I fixed it. I have I have three cameras <laughs> over here. It was blocking something. It had tilted down. I'd like to welcome back to Fade to Black, Marco Vagata. There he is right there. Marco, good evening, young man. Mexico City, really? Thank you, Jimmy. It's a pleasure to be with you on the show tonight. I said, uh, yeah, it's a pleasure. It, I, the honor is all mine. Mexico City? That's correct. We're in Mexico uh, it, City. It, 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 is, is that like the craziest, biggest, most insane place you could possibly live? That's that's what they say, but it feels pretty quiet around here. <laughs> Marco, I, uh, I, I just got back. Uh, well, I didn't just, but I am going back in a couple of weeks. I'm going back to Cairo. And I remember uh, fl flying into Cairo, you know, and I'm glued to the window and I'm looking for the Great Pyramid, you know, <laughs> as, you know, flying, coming around. And I thought to myself, Cairo's the biggest city in the world. Look at that. You know, it is just massive. And uh, making the comparisons to that in like, you know, Mexico City and, and other, you know, uh, big, big cities, Seoul, South Korea and so forth. Uh, big cities around the world, um, you have to deal with with everything, traffic and and people and congestion, and it's uh, uh, but it's where the action is. You know, is Mexico City? Before we get started, 
Um, is it 24 hours a day? Yes, yes, it's pretty much a 24 hour city. Yeah, yeah, so is Cairo. Cairo uh, just was unreal to me to see that's that city just it doesn't have an off switch. <laughs> Los Angeles, no nah, man, there's only a couple of city blocks in LA that stay open, you know, West Hollywood or whatever. The rest of it, no man, nine, nine, ten o'clock. Ah, nah, city shuts down, but not, 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 not Cairo, not Mexico City, at London, London, 24 hours, man. That it just never stops over there. Um, I wanted to uh, ask you this before we get started, uh, because of what you do. There has been, uh, it's been going on for a little more than 10 years. Um, I saw the first uh, objects uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, that are coming out of Mexico, uh, 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 purported to be allegedly to be extremely old with images. I know you've seen them of 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 ET, of alien grace, flying saucers, the solar system, suns, planets, comets, uh, a language uh, that nobody can really read and understand. But there are thousands and thousands and thousands of these objects. You can buy them on eBay now. Um, what do you make of those uh, when you see them? Are they real? Are some of them real? Well, it's certainly a very thriving business. So just judging at how many of them, as you say, are on sale on eBay and various websites. So uh, in my opinion, it's just horrible handicraft, uh, meaning that I would not buy one even as a paperweight. Uh, there is no way this can be original. I've seen many of them uh, not uh, even close to an original authentic artifact. Um, I have, uh, I can't, I can't say any more than this, but I'll say this. Um, I have a, a, a friend, a close friend that just, uh, within the month, uh, went down to one of these sites in Mexico. Uh, he live streamed, he FaceTimed me, um, or not on this phone. He FaceTimed me on this phone. <laughs> anyway, he FaceTimed me from this cave. And he's down there live, and he's got a light on his head, and he's FaceTiming, and he's digging up these artifacts. And I don't know how many feet underground he was, but uh, and he got a, a couple of things out of one of the walls that were down there, but he dug them up himself. Um, I... I you know, it's one of those things. It's like too good to be true. And then I'm watching somebody that I know, love, and trust go through this, uh, going through these holy crap periods. If they're fake, how do they get them under the ground? Well, I would love to see one come out of uh, an actual archaeological excavation. There are many cases of artifacts that are just planted in places uh, by people that claim uh, that uh, they're authentic. But I can just uh, tell you something. If they were authentic, uh, not a single one of those would have been able to leave the country. The National Institute of Anthropology, they have a page uh, on those artifacts. Uh, they have uh, no archaeological value, no historical value whatsoever. You can take them in and out of the country without a problem. Um, so if they were genuine artifacts, I can guarantee you that all these people would be in jail by now. So if I went down to Mexico, to be clear, if I go down to Mexico and get one of these, mm -hmm. I can come back through customs and they don't care? Well, that, that would really depend on the specific uh, customs agent uh, that right, uh, right. you encounter. But at least as far as the National Institute of Anthropology is concerned, uh, they are of no archaeological or historical value, just modern handicraft. And uh, as I said, I would love to see one come out of an actual archaeological dig. Uh, but all the ones I've seen, they're just horrible handicraft. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They are very interesting. And, uh, there's there's somebody if 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 they are fake which like i said it's too good to be true right it's just like some of it is too good to be true but um there there's a factory somewhere <laughs> they're mm -hmm. cranking those things out man oh, don't, don't, don't believe it you need a factory for that you just need a few people to to manufacture all of those there's actually a whole town in jalisco i think it's called ojuelos so there are literally dozens of people that are manufacturing those artifacts day in and day out right very interesting i did see um 
uh, not to spend any more time on this, uh, the jury is uh, is out. You know, we we will wait and see. But um, I did uh, about seven or eight years ago. Uh, one of the people down there uh, doing a dig um, sent me uh, a video, and it was it was pretty crazy. It was pretty crazy. It was uh, uh, they pulled out. It was about the size of a washing machine. Mm-hmm. Right, a big carving. It was of a chair and a, uh, you know, uh, like a king sitting in this mm-hmm. chair. It was it, pink granite. This thing was huge. It had to weigh a couple of tons. And they put ropes around it, and they they, they showed the whole thing of them digging it out of the ground and then pulling it up out of the cave, getting it in the back of a pickup truck, put, putting uh, getting it to town, hosing it down. And then uh, doing close-up photography on it, and they sent me that video. And I thought, man, it's one thing to you know to carve you know some little thing, right? But but this thing was giant. I I, I don't know. I, I I don't know. And there were you alien heads. You would be all surprised over. that uh, what people can falsify. And I can guarantee you, there are way more interesting things to get pulled out of the ground uh, without uh, uh, calling in aliens and uh, things of very questionable. <laughs> Provenance. Yeah, the um, the what what I've always found really interesting about all of those objects uh, coming out of Mexico, it's like every single little thing that is big in pop culture is what is on these objects, right? You, you know what I mean? Flying why. saucers with yeah. a dome, or or yeah. or you know the alien grade, the almond eyes, and yeah. you know that cla- you know it, it's like, it's like everybody with uh, way too many episodes of X Files, and uh, they put them on a piece of stone. Yeah, it could be, could be, could be just yeah. that. That's that's um, my guess, at least. Uh, yeah, guess. yeah. I, I would love for that to be true. I think as much as you, but yeah, yeah. We'll see. But that's the other part. You know, you can't. You can't dismiss all of it, uh, but if, if that's it, it. It ruins, it diminishes stuff that is real. Right. That's the other that's, thing. That's the main issue. I think that's really the main issue. There is so much serious research that is going on into the origins of the civilization, uh, into the ancient Mesoamerican past, and I think uh, it all gets pulled together with these uh, like. Uh, fakes and uh, hoaxes and so it's very hard for the public to tell what is true from what is just uh, a fraud uh, which is i think just perpetrated by people who are after the money if i could arrange for you to go to one of these sites would, oh, I, would, would love you... to. I would love to okay all right i'll make it happen i'll you make it happen yeah no i'll make it happen okay and i, I just i you go you're you're the professional here and will, you can go in open and... mind yeah, you, you have to have an open mind. You go in with a closed mind, you're going to get burned. <laughs> so you, you've got to go in with an open mind. That that goes with anything. Um, it, which reminds me, you know, your last book being on Atlantis. Mm-hmm. And uh, Robert Schock said something to me. I'm going to share this with you and get your reaction. He said something once that I just never forgot. He said, you know, in, in academia... It used to be you couldn't say the big A, alien. Now you can't. You can't say the other big A, though. Right. Atlantis. Right. <laughs> you're still not allowed. Right. And and for you, you're kind of both. And then, but there's a third point here. Um, when it comes to North, Central, and South America, if the, if you're talking about anything older than 10,000 B, you know, B.C., 13,000, 14,000 be you get laughed out of the room. They don't want to have that conversation. And we're finding more and more things uh, that are pointing back, uh, pushing back the dates very, very far. What we just found in San Diego two years ago, you know, is pushing back the date a hundred thousand years. It, right. It's not, it's no longer this 10,000 BC thing, is it? But it's a tough battle um, right. in Central and South America. Yeah, I think it's been a huge parting shift uh, in uh, 
um, American archaeology really to move away from the Clovis parting. So it is a now very old fashioned idea that the first inhabitants of the American continent, uh, they moved uh, through the Bering Strait uh, some 10,000 or 12,000 years ago. And there was absolutely nobody in the, in the Americas before that. And then you start up uh, finding sites like Pera Furada, like Monte Verde in Chile, for instance, just to name a few, without even going to the more extreme and controversial ones like the Cerruti Mastodon site mm -hmm. in, in San Diego. This site are 17, 27,000 years old, as is the case of Monte Verde. These have been uh, carbon dated. There have been multiple academic papers published on those sites. And these have literally shattered uh, the Clovis first party. So this idea that the Americas were essentially unpopulated, uninhabited uh, before roughly the end of the last ice age. And so that also forces us to consider different ways uh, that people may have uh, enter the Americas, not only through the Bering Strait, but also potentially people are now talking about the Pacific Corridor, so maritime migration to the Pacific and even Atlantic Corridor, which is a so-called Salutran hypothesis. So all of a sudden you have many different scenarios for the peopling of the Americas. Uh, are you suggesting something transoceanic? Yes, I think, and I think that's becoming increasingly mainstream. Uh, there is a very interesting book. Uh, it's called Across Atlantic Ice, uh, which was published by a Stanford anthropologist that suggests that as early as 30,000 years ago, people crossed uh, through the North Atlantic uh, on the ice shelves uh, that extended at the time uh, across from Norway through Iceland, Greenland, and into the American continent. I think that's uh, an equally plausible um, pathway, as is the Bering Strait. Now, and what about across the Pacific? That would be boats. That would be boats, for sure. That would be boats. Uh, there is evidence that uh, what we consider to be primitive people did uh, already master navigation uh, probably over 20,000, maybe even up to 30,000 years ago or more. And so I don't think it's entirely impossible that uh, people could have crossed uh, the Pacific sort of island hopping uh, and uh, reached the Americas uh, thousands of years ago. There is actually evidence of a Polynesian ancestry in some South American tribes uh, mm -hmm. where you were on the coast of Peru in Chile as well, which is evidence of a transoceanic contact. Uh, now there is still a lot of debate as to which direction that transoceanic contact took, where it was the South Americans that went into the Pacific, where it was Polynesians that migrated into South America or both. So there is still a, a, a lot of research that needs to happen before we can get the full picture. Now, do you, um, in, in saying that, um, the uh, the general, and I, I believe it to be completely wrong, but what is taught in academia is that everything is Central Africa, South Africa, uh, the origins and everything migrated out from there. Um, as we look closer and closer at DNA, it, it's kind of backing away from that. Now you have Northern Siberia, you have uh, the South Pacific, right? It, it, you have different origin points mm -hmm. that are, are moving around the world. And it just, it doesn't seem to be straight out of Africa. Right. I think you have a very strong evidence that at least one of the main ancestral lineages uh, of modern humans uh, came out of East Africa. So there is plenty of evidence that that's the case. The point is that there was a, probably not the only lineage. We're constantly finding fossils from other parts of the world that uh, suggest that uh, different human species may have originated in different parts of the planet. And we ourselves, as modern humans, are in fact a hybrid species, so the result of interbreeding across different human species. Uh, uh, many, actually a vast majority of modern humans living today, we still carry Neanderthal DNA, some of us carry Denisovan DNA. There are still many other uh, early human or hominin species that we don't know of uh, that are just uh, now being uncovered by archaeologists, by paleontologists, Homo naledi, for instance, uh, in uh, uh, South Africa, Denisovans in uh, Central Asia. And uh, it's very likely that there are even more ancestral human species that we have not uh, yet uh, discovered, at least that we have not yet found uh, the fossil remains, uh, but may still have uh, left uh, a record in our own DNA. 
Well, don't forget the Mexican artifacts say we have alien DNA. You can't leave that. <laughs> you can't. You can't leave that out of there too, as well. <laughs> right. Right. Um, it, it's the um, uh, now. Let's uh, let's talk about some other uh, dating before we get into specifics. Um, when we look at Peru and some of the things uh, in that general area, Peru, Bolivia, uh, certainly Puma Punku, uh, Nazca is fascinating too as well. And I think that that's much older than than uh, is, is is stated currently. But but Puma Punku is interesting, and Tiwanaku mm-hmm. is interesting because of the the uh, cosmic alignments that are there uh, to certain star systems and. If we turn now, we have computer technology, so we can date. You know, we can roll back the clocks and and look at the celestial alignments to these monuments and and get a general idea of when they were built. And that's why some of the dating in that area right there is fifteen thousand mm-hmm. BC. That's a that's a pretty crazy thing, and that's where academia steps in and says, "No, we can't have this discussion." But it, it's it's uh, I think it's worth uh, I, I think it's it's circumstantial for sure, mm-hmm. but it's something that we have to take a look at and we have to have an open mind, don't we? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think in the case of Tiwanaku and uh, and Pumapunku, the study of the astronomical alignments at the site goes back over 70 years uh, to Arthur Poznanski, who was the first to conduct uh, this kind That's of right. uh, archaeoastronomical work uh, at uh, Tiwanaku. And I think uh, the, the research is, uh, is fundamentally solid if you believe the premises are correct. So if you believe that the Kalasasaya Temple, in the specific case of Tiwanaku, was really built as an astronomical observatory, and what we're observing is not a product of chance. So then most of the calculations done by Poznanski are in fact correct uh, and they still hold water to, to this day. Now, that's what archaeologists uh, or most archaeologists uh, um, at least uh, uh, would uh, disagree with on the function of this building as to whether these alignments, where these correlations were deliberate uh, or just a product of chance. And that's where, as you say, I think we need uh, a lot more evidence. Uh, in the specific case of Tiwanaku, there is a evidence of at least five buried cities underneath the present ruins. And the what uh, archaeologists have excavated is just the most recent of these, uh, which is dated to around the 200 AD. And I have no reason of questioning or debating that data. However, uh, there is a very, I think, very strong indication that the earlier cities that still lie buried deeper underground uh, may date back thousands of years. And a lot of the most sophisticated stonework that we see in places like Tiwanaku and Pumapunku may have originated with that earlier culture. How, um, uh, oh, one, one fascinating thing about Tiwanaku, it looks like you're in Egypt, mm-hmm. right? It's got a vibe. The boats, the reed boats, the thing, the paintings, the, the architecture. Yeah, cool. um, it, it looks like you are in Luxor. It, it 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 doesn't have a, it doesn't look Peruvian, and is that is that done deliberately or or where's this influence coming from? It, is is there an Egyptian influence at Tiwanaku? In that kind of uh, more than an Egyptian influence, uh, I would look at uh, the kind of megalithic architecture that you find at places like Tiwanaku. So, if you look at the architectural style of Tiwanaku, of Cusco, of many of these megalithic sites in the Indies, like Old Ante Tambo, uh, even Machu Picchu itself, uh, there is a, a very strong uh, parallel, a very strong similarity with the kind of stonework you see in places like the Sphinx Temple or the Valley Temple, a Giza or the Osirion of Abyssos, that style of monumental megalithic architecture with very precisely cut stone blocks, a very geometric uh, type of architecture. And that's something you find on both sides of the Atlantic. You find that uh, in Egypt, uh, you find that in South America, arguably you find that in many other places around the world, which is uh, to me one of the most uh, convincing uh, um, hints uh, at the existence of uh, a prehistoric uh, civilization, of a global prehistoric uh, advanced civilization that vanished uh, probably 10,000 years ago or more. 
It, it, so the idea that something came out of the Mediterranean, don't know what, but uh, and made it over to the Americas, that that's on the table. I think I think that could be. Uh, the thing is that we don't have to limit ourselves to only one model. I think uh, many of the analogies between old world and new world cultures can be better explained by assuming that uh, all these civilizations essentially inherited uh, their culture from an even older civilization that was a global civilization that exerted its influence on various parts of the world. However, it's also possible that uh, even during historical times, uh, there was uh, some contact uh, between cultures on both sides of the Atlantic. You have many accounts of uh, transoceanic voyages uh, uh, much and long before the time of Columbus, uh, that uh, seem to point to at least some form of contact between old world and new world civilizations. So, um, the so you would have the existence of, and then we'll start to focus on the Americas here in just a second. But um, you would would this advanced civilization have existed alongside the Neolithic cultures? You know, the new Stone Age cultures around the world, and they. Uh, were they teaching the the Neolithic uh, advanced things and and helping them? You know what I mean. Were they existing side by side? I think I think that's the puzzle because you have to imagine, as you say, a pretty advanced civilization, maybe not space age advanced, but definitely by the standard of the time that existed probably in an isolated part of the world. And that's why I think this idea of Atlantis or a sunken Atlantic landmass is so appealing because that would provide a homeland for that civilization, which sits uh, almost exactly in between the old world uh, and the new world. And then you have all these many accounts from very various civilizations from Egypt, from South America, from Mexico, that talk about the arrival of these uh, gods or these uh, strangers from across the sea that came and brought a much more advanced civilization. They brought agriculture, they brought, agri uh, they brought uh, uh, knowledge of astronomy, mathematics, uh, the calendar. And you find very similar traditions all over the world, as if uh, uh, civilization was in a way a gift uh, of the gods or a gift from that uh, worldwide civilization civilization that spread uh, across the entire globe. So the when we look at uh, different examples, Pumapunku being one, uh, Gobekli Tepe uh, being another, um, I think that the Orkney Islands have mm -hmm. evidence of uh, extreme antiquity. Totally. Um, and other sites around the world that predate Ancient Sumer and, and Giza, you know, that's 3000 BC. But now we're talking about seven, eight, nine, ten 10 millennia before that. Those cultures, whoever built these sites around the world, would have to have been taught mm -hmm. how to quarry, how to engineer how to alignment, uh, you know, like you just said, uh, astronomical alignments and, and engineering and mathematics. All of these things have to come into play. Those cultures had to have been taught. They didn't. They didn't invent all of this on their own at the same time, did they? Yeah, and that's exactly what you see when um, John Anthony West, for instance, spoke of Egyptian civilization as a legacy. Essentially, that's a, that's what we find not only in Egypt but in many other parts of the world. This is a civilization uh, apparently just uh, appearing as if out of nowhere, already fully formed uh, with a fully developed uh, calendar, mathematics, uh, astronomy, monumental architecture. So that prompts the question, where did they get it from? When you have a site like Gobekli Tepe, for instance, uh, which is one of the earliest, uh, if not the earliest, monumental structure uncovered to date uh, that already displays monumental architecture um, of a kind uh, employing 50 tons of stone pillars precisely oriented astronomically aligned st uh, structures that immediately prompts the question where did uh, the masterminds, where did the builders of all these sites uh, come from? And it's quite interesting to me that all these sites where you find these incredible megalithic structures are also cradles of agriculture. These are some of the places where very mysteriously, just around uh, 
10,000, 12,000 years ago, agriculture appears and spreads throughout the world in very specific and from very specific places, including Mesopotamia, Central America, South America. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, you have to imagine how is it that humanity lived essentially for 200,000 years without any knowledge of agriculture, of stonework, of astronomy, monumental architecture, and then all of a sudden, around the same time, all over the world, you have this explosion of civilization. You have agriculture, you have monumental architecture. Civilization basically starts as if out of nowhere and coming out of literally 190,000 years of darkness. So something must have happened at that point in time that triggered what he called an accelerated evolution of human civilization. Yeah, complete, complete acceleration. And which, you know, and it doesn't make sense. And the the world, okay, it's time for me to piss some people off, right? Not necessarily my audience, but those that are going to be listening to the show. It's it's this. We have been we we have been okay. We haven't put the system in check yet, but we should have when we have been told. Uh, forever that the Egyptians and Mesopotamia too, the same thing happened at the same time, but that one day they were wearing animal skins. The very next day, the Giza plateau and we were okay with it. We didn't question that. Nobody stepped back and went, seems kind of quick, right? <laughs> really? He just went from the uh, uh, stone age man, a tribe in the desert to leveling off uh, a, a plateau of limestone and and just carving five million rocks and building a couple of pyramids, you you just went from that to that. But we were okay with it. We didn't put the system in check. I think I think we're smarter than that now. But we bought that story for a long time. I think there is always this assumption, uh, and we always tend to believe that evolution is a linear process, and so that um, eventually we will find uh, that more primitive or simpler stage of civilization. And the problem is that the further we push back, uh, uh, the more things are not getting uh, simpler. They're, in fact, getting more complex. So when you find sites like Gobekli Tepe, this is just shifting back the question of the origin of a civilization. And uh, you also mentioned Egypt. I think this is a great example because some of the greatest uh, pyramids, if you think about the Giza Plateau, they were not built towards the end of Egyptian civilization, but right at the very beginning of Egyptian that's civilization. That's my point. But that's my point. And we've been, we've, we've been okay with that BS. Right. We've nobody you you would have thought that I mean we're smarter than that. You know, that we would have just stepped back and said, wait a minute here. The biggest and the best of everything was was built first and and before that there was nothing. And then we just kept no, and we, we never questioned it. Mm -hmm. You know, and Marco, I I I think now we're starting to realize. Uh, that it's the world is not what it seems to be, and it's not what we've been taught. And if we found one Gobekli Tepe or one Puma Punku, right, there are others, and there's more to be discovered, and we're going to continue to push these dates back. Mm -hmm. I think one has to realize that many of these ancient civilizations were quite literally living among the ruins of a much older, much earlier civilization. So when uh, you... Uh, Take, take Egypt, for instance, where you have clearly like the pharaonic civilization of the dynastic period. You can see a progression there where people went from more primitive forms of living to more structured forms of living. My point is that all these great monuments, uh, the pyramids, the obelisks, the colossal statues, all of that was already there from an earlier civilization. Yeah, so much of this I, I, I started over again, but in a way living or squatting yeah, among the ruins of that much greater earlier civilization. So you're suggesting, and I agree with you, but you're suggesting that they inherited mm -hmm. the pyramids. They did. They did. Uh, I do believe that these were already existing structure probably thousands of years earlier, and the mm -hmm. dynastic Egyptian civilization uh, uh, first lived uh, for thousands of years uh, around uh, these structures. Uh, uh, 
creating uh, essentially a whole religion around them. And then uh, once uh, their level of culture also picked up, they started imitating those structures, they started building their own pyramids, uh, which of course are much uh, uh, simpler in design, in construction technique. Um, and uh, I do believe they also attempted a restoration of this monument. That's why you find that places like Giza, that many of these uh, very ancient monuments were restored. They were reused uh, during the pharaonic period and potentially repurposed as well. And I can only imagine going back then, you know. So, so what is that? I don't know, man. It's pretty cool, though, huh? You know, <laughs> I mean, it's it's like that. What's it? What's it for? Don't don't know, but. I think we're going to keep it. Hey, let's build let's build a city here and 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 let's let's keep this thing. It's pretty cool. But that's probably how it went down. I mean there's being void the the point being void of any you know signatures on it at all. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, I know. I know if if you built it you would have a big V on the very front of it, and you would put the biggest Vigato V on the front of it to let everybody know who you are, right? And and that's that's what's missing from from right. uh, the plateau. I think what's happened is up uh, what they call a flattening of ancient chronologies. And of course, I grew up in Italy, which is a place which is full of ancient ruins. If you go to a place like Rome, you see all these uh, incredibly old ancient buildings that are coexisting with modern ones. And that's perhaps why for someone like me, it's not hard to imagine whole civilization is quite literally living among the ruins of these earlier and earlier right. and more advanced uh, yeah. civilizations. Yeah, 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 yeah. You see that when you, you know, I, I just got back from London, right, last week. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's London, but people, we see the moderns. London is friggin' old. I mean, it's, that's an old city, man. It's an old city. It's a couple thousand years old. So, you know, when you go and you, you look at, that, you know, Westminster, right? We take that for granted. We do. It's sitting right there. That thing is a thousand years old. It's a thousand years old. Sitting around modern stuff. It's it's you know, and you walk around London and you see that everywhere you go. Um, and of course in Cairo, that's exactly what you see. You see stuff, mm -hmm. you see a bank, a modern bank or a modern condo next to something that is, you know, it's three thousand years old. <laughs> it's like crazy. It blows my mind. Now let uh, let's talk about the Americas here. When when um, uh, I, I'm always reminded of uh, uh, a few things, but um, just like the Denisovan right now have surfaced. Denisovan that that's a modern discovery. That's modern. We still don't understand the significance of that, and I wouldn't be surprised if it was the Denisovans or something similar that uh, taught the people of Gobekli Tepe how to build that monument, right? Uh, that's a, it's a whole nother situation. They're coming down from the north, right? From Central Asia, heading south, maybe even into Egypt, I don't know. But uh, here in, in the Americas, we have the Olmecs. And one of the most mysterious cultures um, that we, we just don't know, we don't know anything about them, do we? Well, I think you, in the Americas you have, and I'm talking particularly about uh, uh, Mexico and Central America, you have a very similar picture to what you find in Egypt, in uh, Mesopotamia as well, where you have these uh, very sophisticated civilization that is uh, uh, appearing as if uh, out of nowhere. So for centuries, uh, archaeologists, historians, antiquarians had been debating the question of the origin of the Mayas. So they clearly found all these great ruins, uh, these great uh, abandoned cities in the jungle, and that immediately prompted a question as to where did these people come from? How, um, how long ago did they leave? And for centuries, people didn't really have an answer to that question, because that civilization appeared or uh, literally to have uh, sprung out of the ground or of the forest uh, completely and fully formed with, uh, again, a perfectly developed ar architecture, calendar, sophisticated mathematics, uh, astronomy, and so on. Then it was in the 1930s uh, that uh, archaeologists began to recognize the Olmecs as the true mother culture of the Americas. And again, we're not talking about uh, 
centuries ago. We're just talking about the 1930s. That's not mm -hmm. even 100 years ago. Before that time, nobody had even heard about uh, the Olmecs. Uh, so these are still, by most accounts, uh, a relatively recent discovery. However, what uh, the discovery the Olmecs did uh, was simply to push back in time the problem of the question of the origins of Mesoamerican civilization, because then the question became who taught the Olmecs? When you look at Olmec sites, Olmec art, Olmec artifacts, they don't get any simpler, they don't get any more formative than the Mayas. In many respects, I actually would suggest that Olmec art is even more advanced or more sophisticated than the Maya art. Now we know, for instance, that the Olmecs were the true inventors of the Mesoamerican calendar. They invented the earliest writing system in the Americas. And all of that, once again, seems to have appeared out of thin air, out of um, out of out of the blue, quite literally. And so that again prompts the question, you know, who taught the Olmecs? Where did the Olmecs get this knowledge? And by the way, when we when we talk about the Olmecs, we're not even talking about that long ago. The Olmecs are now believed to have originated sometime around 1800 BC and have lasted until about 800 BC. So by most accounts, the Olmecs are, for instance, uh, more recent uh, than the pyramids in Egypt. Uh, they're about contemporary with Ramses II or most uh, uh, historical figures that are very well established in Western chronologies. Uh, um, so once again, you have these uh, very long uh, period of time from when humans first appeared and first entered into the American continent to the appearance of Olmec civilization of literally thousands of years that is entirely unaccounted for. Now, what predated the Olmecs? Let's go backwards. Well, that's uh, that's the million dollar question. Exactly. Uh, right now, people are debating where exactly did the Olmec civilization originate, and there are even questions as to whether the Olmecs were a civilization, uh, as we um, as we like, would would consider like or we would define a civilization uh, in, in modern terms. So, um, many very early sites have been found in the Valley of Mexico that appear to be roughly contemporary with the Olmecs. And so uh, that has caused this model of a single origin of Mesoamerican civilization with the Olmecs, so being uh, the mother culture of Mesoamerica, to be replaced by a new model in which you have actually several Several different points of origin of Mesoamerican civilization. Now we know, for instance, that just at the same time as the Olmecs were developing on the Gulf Coast of Mexico, you had other centers of civilization in the Valley of Oaxaca, in the highlands of Guerrero, in the Central Valley of Mexico, for instance. They were roughly contemporary with the Olmecs and they showed a very similar level of civilization to the Olmecs. Now, if you dig even farther back, then that's when things uh, get uh, very blurry because uh, there is uh, some evidence uh, that dates back to very early excavation, we can talk about that, uh, of uh, very ancient uh, early Mexican civilizations in the Valley of Mexico. So in the 1920s, extensive excavations were conducted at various sites in the Valley of Mexico, at Azcapotzalco mostly, uh, which revealed uh, what looked like buried cities that could date back to over 10,000 years ago. They were buried very deep beneath volcanic layers. Uh, but of course, that's still very controversial. There has not been a lot more research into that very early prehistoric Mexican civilization. Now, uh, let's, uh, I'm very interested in this. If, if something like that was discovered, that would be that would be on the level of Gobekli Tepe. Mm -hmm. Now, now we're we're talking about rewriting history completely. Yes, so we're talking about excavations that were conducted uh, at a very great depth. Uh, um, there are two sites uh, uh, in Mexico that. Uh, well, when you say great depth, what are you talking about? Uh, we're talking about forty up to sixty feet uh, below the ground. Oh, okay, okay. So we're we're talking about really, really deep, and you need to understand. Uh, 
the geology of the Valley of Mexico. This is a volcanic area where literally surrounded by volcanoes. So they've been erupting immense quantities of ash, of pyroclastic flows, of lava over thousands, if not tens of thousands of years. So it's very reasonable to assume that if an early prehistoric Mexican civilization really existed, it would be found now buried dozens of feet, uh, maybe even hundreds of feet below the ground, below all of these volcanic deposits. And this is exactly what archaeologists have found uh, at two places in particular, uh, which are still very controversial. One is Quiquilco to the south of Mexico City, and the other one is Azcapotzalco, which is also now a neighborhood of Mexico City. Let me start with the first one, with Quiquilco. This is a massive circular pyramid once again, located in the south of Mexico City. There was a huge controversy when the pyramid was first uncovered in the early 1900s, because the pyramid had been apparently buried under a lava flow that had been dated to 7,000 years BCE. And so that prompted the question of how old is that pyramid? At the time, most archaeologists argued that the pyramid was at most 2,000, uh, maybe 2,500 years old, but would never go as far as saying that that pyramid was seven thousand and not say nine thousand years old as the age of the lava flow would suggest this is still an open question in mesoamerican archaeology there have been literally hundreds of papers on the age of the lava flow that buried the quick pyramid and this is just the tip of the iceberg because there is evidence that even below that layer that ended up being buried by the lava flow, there were even earlier layers of civilization that have not yet been excavated that could potentially show Mesoamerican civilization to be literally thousands of years older than is presently assumed. Well, then you would have to, I mean, it's just, it's, it's basic logic, right? If the lava flow is, that's the easiest thing to carbon date. It's full of carbon. Right? <laughs> so, right, so that's the, and if you're carbon dating that to 7,000 BCE, it's, it's, it's covering something that was already built. So then what mm -hmm. is already built is already older than, I mean, it's just logic, right? So now we're right. talking about the possibility of, you know, you don't know when necessarily when the stonework mm -hmm. was done, but it could be thousands of years or 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 older. And now we're getting into uh, before the end of the last ice age. Right. And, and that was dug by professional archaeologists. We're not talking about uh, uh, a random excavation by some amateur. That was done by some of the foremost authorities in Mesoamerican archaeologists at the time. And as I say, there was a huge controversy. It's still a huge controversy in Mesoamerican archaeology. The other site uh, that I mentioned is Azcapotzalco, which is uh, now sadly a neighborhood of Mexico City. So no more excavation is possible at that site. It's been completely built over over the past century. But an American archaeologist and geologist, William Niven, conducted very extensive excavations at Azcapotzalco. And what he uncovered were three different layers, almost like three buried cities, uh, uh, the earliest of which he dated to around 2,000 years ago. He found another pavement that was buried over 20 feet below the ground, which he dated to 5,000 or 6,000 years of BCE. And then a third pavement that he believed could go down to over 10,000 years uh, BC. Now again, that caused a huge controversy in Mexico. Very famous Mexican archaeologists, international archaeologists were invited to the site and they all confirmed the authenticity of uh, Niven's findings. So it's a pity that uh, all of these uh, excavations were then later abandoned. Uh, I don't want to say they were covered up necessarily, but at least nobody wanted to get involved with something that was uh, so controversial, potentially so old. And so all of these uh, ended up being uh, basically forgotten uh, with the events that then followed with uh, the Mexican Revolution and so on. And so all the site uh, eventually got abandoned. It was built over. And right now we have no way of knowing whether it was actually something of archaeological interest at that depth, where Niven claimed he found his buried cities. I don't have um, issues with that. And it, and I, I, one of the reasons for that is when you have a site... Uh, like we do right now in San Diego, which is showing 
actual tool marks, right? Knife marks on on mammoth bones. Mammoth. Mammoth bones, right? <laughs> tool marks, saw marks, cut marks. Um that that we're we're pushing it back. You said twenty seven thousand years. They it, it, mm-hmm. no matter yes, what, it's very range. old. Day. Mm-hmm. And San Diego is is part of you know central yeah, it's Central places. America, man. You know it's that's mm-hmm. it. It's on the Mexican border. Yeah. Well, you have many many very controversial um, finds as well in Mexico. Uh, there is a site in Puebla called the Huayatlaco where these uh, alleged human footprints uh, were found. They were dated to over 250,000 uh, years ago. Uh, again, a huge controversy. I think right now the academic community is increasingly opening up to the possibility that the dating of that site is correct and there were humans uh, walking uh, in the valley of Puebla 250,000 years ago. Now the question, of course, becomes who are these humans? Were they modern humans? Were they Neanderthals? Were they Denisovans? Uh, and I think these are all open questions as of now. Are you going to be watching? Uh, we're going to take a break here in a second. Uh, you got the UFO hearing going on uh, tomorrow, in Mexico. Um, are you going to be watching that? Uh, I may. I may. Yes. It's a really big deal. It's a really big deal. Um, um, and, and staying on this, I just got two minutes before the break. With every, it seems like. Um, Marco, that we're getting a lot of the fantastical all at the same time. It, it's it's all coming down on us. And not only is it UFOs and ETs in contact, but it's it's exoplanets. It's 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 science. It's physics. It's the uh, you know uh, the multiverse and parallel worlds and pushing back the dates of humans and lost civilizations and it's it's like everything that was just like in a Jules Verne book you know a hundred years ago is is coming true today. I mean, what's next? The Hollow Earth? I think we're just uh, probing deeper. I think as uh, science advances. Uh, with new methodologies and new techniques that were not even available just 10 years ago. And we can talk about that. For instance, these uh, incredible LIDAR surveys were in Django, Guatemala, that revealed all these huge Maya cities uh, with geophysical surveys. Uh, you saw these muon detectors in the Great Pyramid, for instance. I think with all these new technologies, we've been able to advance our understanding of civilization at a pace uh, that uh, uh, that would not have been possible just uh, 10 years ago. Go. And so that's why I think we're starting to see more and more knowledge uh, uh, being uh, being developed, uh, all the theories being replaced by new ones as new evidence comes in, and many old paradigms being shattered. I think even of a site like Gobekli Tepe, Gobekli Tepe was completely unknown uh, just 20 years ago, and now it's literally taken the field of archaeology by storm. Think how, how many more sites like Gobekli Tepe we may find over the next uh, few years so not to speak of the next few decades, uh, and w- what uh, these sites can tell us about human origins. Well, it, it, one thing that uh, we're finding out, Gobekli Tepe was deliberately buried, but these cities in in Guatemala, Central America, right, that it shows you how quickly nature can come in right. and, and, and disappear it. Right, but that it seems like every day we're finding another city under the jungle canopy, and you can't hide from lidar. That the last number, I'm sure you have a, a more mm-hmm. accurate number, but over over ten thousand miles of roads, mm-hmm. ten thousand miles, ten thousand miles of roads yeah. under the jungle. That's 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 crazy to me. We never knew ten years ago. We didn't know it was there. And and now we're discovering a city every other day, uh, you know, underneath the jungle canopy. Yeah, just just in the Petén region, uh, uh, these lidar surveys have uncovered over sixty thousand structures. So that's uh, uh, pretty much like the same number of buildings that you have in Manhattan. Yeah, yeah, and, that's uh, about right. Yeah, that's that's happened only within uh, the last uh, few years, literally. So just think of how much more we can uncover. And I would say that uh, Mesoamerican archaeology is uh, made up 
or even more complicated by the environment. It's a very hostile environment where you have jungle-covered terrain, locations of very difficult access. It's not the same as Egypt, where pretty much everything gets preserved in sand. Organic remains deteriorate very quickly. Uh, vegetation destroys even the largest structures. They get buried very deeply. Uh, but I do think there is always the possibility, and this is actually what we should be looking for, of a time capsule, whether it is a city that was buried under volcanic ashes, Pompeii, for instance, like think of a Mesoamerican Pompeii, or something that we may find in places where more sheltered by those uh, uh, geological uh, changes that occur within the last 10,000 years or so. They may still preserve, uh, in a way, intact uh, the knowledge of that lost civilization. Why Why is it, unless they have some definitive proof, um, why is it that they always, when this is uh, presented to the press, uh, a new Mayan city, a new Mayan structure, uh, an, another set of Mayan roads, everything is associated with the Mayans. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you've got 60,000 buildings and temples mm -hmm. and pyramids, and 10,000 miles of roads, then the Mayans must have been a population in the tens of millions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is what actually, what, what some of these surveys suggest, that the whole region was inhabited literally by millions of people. It was uh, as densely populated as modern-day UK or France, quite literally, just looking at the density of structure. Now, what these uh, surveys don't tell you, and I think you're spot on, is whether all these structures were built at the same time, or what we're seeing is, in fact, many different layers of civilization. Right. We don't know whether this structure, there may well be like structures there that are thousands of years older than some of the newer structures that uh, are being uncovered, but we have no way of knowing that until we go down and we excavate. Just a, a recent and I think it was as recent as 2017 that this massive Maya site called Aguada Phoenix was discovered in the state of Tabasco, which contains the largest man-made structure in the Americas. This enormous pyramid that measures 1.4 kilometers by 400 meters wide and 50 meters high contains more um, a volume greater than the Great Pyramid of Giza, and that had gone completely unnoticed until 2017, until a ladder scan of the area revealed that massive structure. Uh, now, that structure has been dated uh, to around 1000 BCE, which makes it one of the earliest Maya sites, if it is Maya, that has ever been uncovered. And so you have, once again, evidence of a monumental architecture of an immense scale that dates back to the very beginning of Maya civilization. So the same paradox you find in Egypt with the pyramids with the Giza Plateau. Well, what were the construction techniques of that pyramid? Uh, it's still being excavated. Uh, um, I've seen uh, pictures that show what look like uh, megalithic walls. Uh, so um, what, uh, what I believe, uh, which would be in line with uh, the architectural techniques of the time, is that uh, you typically had um, external retaining walls that were built of huge stone blocks uh, and then the core of the structure was actually built of rubble or just dirt like compacted dirt that's mm -hmm. uh, how you uh, how you uh, find many of these early Maya structures. But the reality is that we don't know until we can actually go and excavate and clear these structures from the vegetation from the dirt that covers them. What was the pyramid that was in Graham Hancock's uh, Netflix series? Uh, the Pyramid of Cholula, I think you're yeah, referring Cholula. to. Cholula. Yes. It's another That's massive it. pyramid. Massive, massive, massive. And yet, uh, Aguada Phoenix, this new Maya site, dwarfs the Cholula Pyramid. Which is already huge. I mean, that, it's, already just, huge. Gi it's like that. just ginormous. Now, the, the other complexity is because you mentioned the Cholula Pyramid, uh, uh, because it's something you find at many of these Mesoamerican sites is that they were continuously rebuilt uh, very often over centuries or thousands of years. So the Pyramid of Cholula remained in use for almost 2,000 years. So it started off as probably a much smaller structure than right. it is today. They, they, it's like three pyramids. Building, right. expanding right. it in layers. And so between uh, the 
newest layer of the pyramid, the oldest layer, you have a gap of probably 2,000 years, maybe more. Like the threat is that our knowledge of what lies beneath the pyramid is still quite limited. Why, um, you know, and I understand Christianity and Catholicism and, and you know, the pursuit of domination and colonizing and, and all of that stuff, but but the Spanish, when they arrived and they witnessed what they did, and it, it doesn't matter what level of culture, whether it was Mayans or, or Aztec or Inca, um, th these beautiful cities and structures are in front of them, and they did everything they could to erase it. Yes. And I, I just, just tried to imagine if that didn't happen, what we would have left uh, for us to go and see and and investigate uh, today, uh, they just went in and and did everything they could to remove it from history. It was a uh, one of the greatest, not the greatest, cultural genocide uh, in history that you can imagine. Like an entire civilization that was entirely eradicated, uh, obliterated to the point of complete oblivion. So all these. Uh, great Maya cities uh, that uh, lay abandoned and they were rediscovered centuries later in, in the jungle. But even think of Mexico City. People had even forgotten the existence of pyramids, of temples. So if you read up some of the uh, academic discussions on the Aztecs, on the level of Mesoamerican civilizations in uh, the late 1700s, early 1800s, they basically consider Mesoamerican People to be essentially primitive so before the time of the Spanish arrival because the Spanish had been so thorough at obliterating, at demolishing every single remain. It's been literally only during the past 200 years that we've been recovering piece by piece the legacy of a Mesoamerican civilization, really restored it to its place in history as one of the great civilizations of antiquity. It's, it's amazing to me to think of uh, uh this basic fact mm -hmm. it's only four mayan codexes in the world yes this is that's astonishing it. that's it mm -hmm. four imagine of all the body of writing there must have existed thousands or tens of yeah, thousands yeah, yeah. imagine that imagine the bonfire that mm -hmm. the spanish you know what i mean they were just yes. just burning it all just burning it but and if those up. if those four didn't get out Yes. Uh, we would know nothing, or just Imagine about nothing. How much more we could know about Maya civilization, those out of the phase in which all these priceless Maya codices were burned, uh, did not happen. Think about the, the Royal Library of Texcoco. It was a city right outside of Mexico City. that boasted over 60,000 volumes, according to Spanish accounts. It was burned to the ground at the time of the Spanish conquest as well. Just imagine how many libraries, how many archives. I, I, I still... Uh, have hope uh, that one day we'll find the equivalent of a Mesoamerican Qumran, uh, so you know like the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls were found in this cave in Israel, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. one day something like that uh, will be found, uh, maybe in a cave uh, in, in Chiapas or in central Mexico where dozens, maybe even hundreds of these codices were somehow preserved uh, from, from the conquest. Yeah, yeah. I, I, we, we, have to, we have to keep that hope. We have to keep that hope. Marco, uh, stay right there. Let's take a quick break. Our guest tonight, Marco Vagato, is with us. We will be right back. Stay with us. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Please visit all of our sponsors. We're taking a quick break here. All of the links are below. And we'll be right back. Join us November 10th, 11th, and 12th, 2023. Live at the Luxor Hotel and Casino on the Las Vegas Strip. As Disclosure Fest Foundation and Fade to Black Radio presents Stairway to the Stars, a human origins science and technology expo. With live talks, lectures, and workshops by world acclaimed researchers and authors featuring topics like human origins, ancient technologies, indigenous teachings, workshops, a mass meditation, yoga and sound healing, music, and so much more. This is Jimmy Church, by the way, and I'll be your host all weekend long. 
Don't miss our intimate sky watch and meteor shower over the infamous Area 51 airspace in Rachel, Nevada, with special surprise celebrity host guiding us through the night. This event will sell out. For more information and tickets, please visit DisclosureFest.org. Hi, everybody. Jimmy Church here. Very special announcement, and that is we are shipping Fade to Black t-shirts again. It's been almost two years. We did a full upgrade to the website, so you can head over to JimmyChurchRadio.com. It's all simple to do, and it's right there. Remember... We broadcast four nights a week, Monday through Thursday. We bring you the best, the brightest, the most knowledgeable and amazing guests, the best conversations. We do that four nights a week. We also do four days a week. We broadcast the news, and we do that live, too, as well. It's not a one-man show. I do it with website support. I do it with producers. I do it with writers and artists. All contribute to the show. The best way to help support what we do here is with the Fade to Black t-shirt. And you can get your Fade to Black t-shirt one of two ways. First... Go to jimmychurchradio.com, order a shirt. It's really that simple. You're going to get a tracking number, it's going to get shipped, and it's going to get autographed. The second way to get a shirt is with a Game Changer membership. Now, the Game Changer membership not only includes a free t-shirt, but you get a private email to me. You get unlimited commercial-free downloads. You have full access to the website, and everything includes includes free shipping and everything is autographed. So help support the show. Get your fade to black t-shirt today. The links are below. You can just go to jimmychurchradio.com and it's right on the website. So there you go. I'm Jimmy Church, fade to black. I'm so excited that I just have one thing to say. Go back Lee Tappy. River Moon Coffee, makers of the Fade to Black Blend. Truly the best coffee on planet Earth. Just visit rivermoonwellness.com or or their Amazon store. It's all simple to do. You can check out the Fade to Black Blend, the Game Changer Blend, or any of their Black Moon Wellness products. It's the only coffee I drink. It is the best, and it's dark. Again, rivermoonwellness.com. Okay, welcome back, Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Our guest tonight, he's back with us, Marco Vigato. And we're talking about uh, lost uh, civilizations here in, you know, I'm going to say it. You, you want to cover, uh, you're covering uh, uh, Central and Central America and the focus on that. I'm going to say all of the Americas. I'm going to mm-hmm. go from the top. We can't forget about Canada. Canada Canada counts. <laughs> Canada. Canada's in the mix too, but it's North, Central, and South America. And and Marco, over the years, um, and I say this not in jest, I'm not trying to be cavalier, that all of the focus, all of it, has has been on uh, Egypt, Sumer, even Rome and Greece, right? And I understand why, you know, I, I, I get that. Uh, but largely, North, Central, and South America, uh, they've been ignored. Uh, it, it, I, I don't know why. Is it pop culture? Is there, is there a reason why there isn't a focus here when it, it, we've got the same action here as anywhere else in the world? I think all these great monuments, uh, if you talk about Egypt, the Greece, Rome, uh, they were right out there in front of everyone to see and and to discover whereas when we talk about uh, mesoamerican archaeology south american archaeology so many of these sites uh, uh, has been discovered within the last 100 years or so i was uh, um, mentioning the olmecs uh, for instance nobody had any knowledge of the olmecs uh, uh, not until the 1930s uh and yeah it's crazy all these, uh, all these new sites are being uh, they're being discovered and so i think uh, that's a uh, that's a part of the picture but then of course uh, um i think uh, it's it's also a question of fashion uh, um right now there are like places uh, uh like sites locations are more in fashion than others uh, 
I think that uh, Central America, South America, they're pretty not in fashion right now. That may change, however, if some truly new monumental discovery takes place. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. But what could be more monumental? I mean, you've got the Temple of the Sun right there in your backyard, mm -hmm. right? That is one of the craziest things on planet Earth. But, you know, and and and, and I get it. It's a tourist destination, but uh, academia is going to always want, you know, to focus on, on Giza, and they want to focus on Mesopotamia. Um, Machu Picchu, dude, Cusco. Cusco mm -hmm. is probably as crazy as anything on this planet mm -hmm. and agree. maybe older and bigger. <laughs> right? I agree. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm uh, pile up all the books have been written and, and rightly so on the on the great pyramid on the on the egyptian monuments uh, and so on you'll probably almost be able to build the great pyramid that as you pile up all the books that have been written on mesoamerican and south american archaeologists i doubt you'll be able to build a small house or a cabin so. sure <laughs> now you're being cavalier okay that's fair enough Marco's got jokes, people. He'll be here all week, uh, by the way. But that's, but it's so true, you know. And and I'm not taking anything away. Uh, I'm, Egypt is what it is, and I'm so fascinated with it. I'm going to be there in a couple of weeks. I just can't wait. I'm, you know, I'm going back for my second trip. But um, here's here's the trippy thing. I'm just going to share this with you. Egypt is full of wonder. Right, everywhere you look, everywhere you drive, up and down the Nile, just pull over. You're going to see mm -hmm. something. Going down the Nile River, sitting on the boat, just look to your left or look to your right. In the middle of nowhere, you're going to see something. The carved in the hills, or you know, you just see stuff everywhere you go. But I got to say, when I went to the Great Pyramid, I didn't feel it. I didn't feel it. There's that you feel the magic at certain temples. Dendera is magical. It's just a magical place. You can feel the energy there. Um, but I, I, I think my expectations for the Great Pyramid were I, the Sphinx. That's got some power to it. That's kind of unexplainable. But, but the Great Pyramid, it's a machine. I'm, I'm going on the record. I, there's. There, I don't think there's, a, I don't think it's a holy place. I don't think it's a spiritual place. I think it's machina. <laughs> I do. Yeah. It's like a machine. Do you get the same feeling? Yeah, no, I do. I do. I think uh, many of these uh, structures, they serve as some functional purpose. So, so there, were, there was clearly to me a difference between uh, like the temples uh, and the buildings uh, that served another kind of purpose and may have been more functional type of purpose. And I, I think, uh, well, in the case uh, in the case of the Great Pyramid, I can relate to my own uh, personal experience. Uh, I always feel overwhelmed by this uh, sensation of just immense age, uh, immense antiquity. When uh, you walk uh, inside the Great Pyramid, around the Giza Plateau, this feeling that uh, you're walking uh, through things, structures are literally thousands and thousands of years old. So you get a feeling of immense antiquity that you don't get at other places. As you say, like Dendera, like Abidos, for instance, Luxor, they they have a very different type of energy, but they don't exude the same sense of antiquity. Karnak is mind-blowing too mm -hmm. as well. I mean, it's... I, I I I guess it, Karnak is just big. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. It is. It, I think it's the biggest. That's the biggest megalithic site in the world. I think it covers the most acres, and so yeah, yeah. That's, that's that's contentious. But yeah, I, I would say it's probably like the largest like single temple complex in in the world. Others would argue that Angkor or Angkor Wat in Cambodia is even larger, but. I think, as usual, with the, with this type of things, it's always going to be a matter of debate. Now, uh, uh, back to I, I want to go back to Cusco for a second. Um, when we look at, we can see the stages, right? You can see the old, mm -hmm. you can see Inca, you can see Spanish, and it's everywhere, built on top of each other. But if you go to the very bottom mm -hmm. 
uh, the, at the start of all of that. Um, what, what kind of dating are we talking about? Because I've heard uh, all kinds of dates thrown around. Um, I'm not, I'm not too positive that we know for sure the specific dating on those. We know where the stones came from, mm -hmm. which is even crazier when you think about it, when you're looking at a 200 ton block, mm -hmm. yeah. how, how it came over those Hills. I, I mm -hmm. still don't. I, I don't have any idea. But what kind of dating are we talking about here? And again, we don't know for sure. Um, and the, in the case of Cusco and the case of many of these megalithic sites in the in the Andes, uh, you have really three layers of construction or civilization. The first one, which is essentially monolithic or megalithic, very similar to the ruins you find in places like Tiwanaku, like Pumapunku. Um, then you have a second layer, which is the polygonal, where you find these incredible stone walls built with perfectly interlocking stone blocks like at Saksai Waman for instance, and the third layer, which is the Inca, uh, which uh, typically uses uh, smaller stones, the construction is not as accurate. So uh, the question is, how old are these different layers? Uh, uh, there's been studies uh, on the polygonal layer, for instance, Machu Picchu with the Torreon, with a number of structures at Machu Picchu, they're also based on their astronomical orientation, which I think in the case of Machu Picchu is much more compelling than at Tiwanaku, by the way, they suggest that this structure could have been built almost 5,000 years ago. And this is only the second layer. Now, when we go farther back at the first layer of construction, the one that really has these immense uh, monolithic, uh, megalithic construction, which are just like purely geometric, uh, carved out of the solid bedrock, uh, that's when you can possibly go back, uh, I would say, even 10,000 years ago or before the end of the last ice age. Now, uh, let's stop right there. How can you say that? I, I mean, that, I, look, I know I, I, I'm going to be I'm going to be the, the skeptic here. <laughs> How can you possibly say that without any evidence? I, again, I do think that more research is, uh, is needed. I don't hold any any smoking gun for that. Um, I think it's more a matter of uh, looking back in time and what is uh, the logical sequence. Uh, as you say, you have this uh, very old layer that was constantly built over, over the course of thousands of years. And so if you believe, and I think there is a uh, evidence for that in the form of astronomical alignment uh, uh, sadly not in the form of carbon dating or radiometric dating because it's much more complicated to date stone uh, but uh, looking at the rate of erosion on the stone there is evidence that some of these uh, relatively newer constructions they may have been built 4,000 5,000 years ago and then you have these even earlier structures deeply mm -hmm. buried underneath them then uh, that suggests they could be thousands of years, uh, maybe even tens of thousands of years older. And you have uh, many interesting parts of Cusco, for instance, where you see evidence of cataclysmic destruction. Now, this is not, uh, um, let me say, an absolute uh, um, or uh, irrefutable evidence for dating, but to me it's very strong evidence that these structures suffered some sort of uh, cataclysm, a cataclysmic destruction when you find 100 tons, 200 tons of stone blocks, uh, as you see in Cusco near Sexy Woman, they are literally scattered around like children's toys. Uh, that makes you wonder what kind of force, what kind of cataclysm could shut their constructions that were more solidly built than any other structure on Earth. And the last time that a cataclysm of that kind occurred in the Earth's geological history was at the end of the Younger Dryas, at the end of the last Ice Age, when many believe that the whole Andean Altiplano, the whole Andean region was literally lifted up by thousands of meters uh, as a consequence of earthquakes of unimaginable strengths, uh, like stronger and more devastating than anything we have experienced in modern times. And this is, I think, the only force that could account for the destruction that we see at these sites. What was the purpose of the construction, uh, well, specifically in Cusco, because mm -hmm. the walls are ginormous, right? Ginor beyond description. But they don't seem to have a purpose, mm -hmm. right? It's not a defensive structure. It's not right. like the walls of a castle 
or it, it, the, mm -hmm. any evidence of great battles or war, or there there was some kind of um, enemy uh, to to defend yourself from, right? That, so if all of that is off of the table, what's the purpose? Well, I think, uh, again, you have to distinguish between the different phases of construction. I do think that some of the later structures, uh, those that belong to the second or third epoch, they were built uh, with a defensive purpose in mind. When you see, for instance, these giant interlocking walls, places like Saxe Woman, it's very hard to argue they didn't serve a defensive purpose. You could also argue they were just built to impress, uh, which I think uh, is also uh, a valid argument uh, when you have this idea idea that uh, a superior civilization uh, just uh, settled there and they built all this structure with the objective of impressing the local population so that they would worship them as gods. I think that's a, that's a possibility. When you go even further back down to this massive mo megalithic, monolithic construction, you, like you find that uh, Tiwanaku at, uh, at Pumapunku then becomes like much more mysterious. Why did they need to use stones that big? Uh, what was the purpose of these structures? In some cases, they looked like temples. Um, in some cases, uh, they uh, could have served up, again, like the pyramids, maybe even some functional uh, purpose uh, that uh, we no longer understand. Uh, now, everything that we see is just the shell of these uh, structures. It's almost as if you had, imagine a power plant, and you stripped it of all the machines, all the turbines, so you just left with the shell of walls so to argue what was it for. So it's, it's very right. hard to even make hypotheses. Well, I mean, you just look at those walls, and it doesn't matter what location, you know, in and around, you know, Cusco, you look at the way and you just go, huh, huh, okay, why? You know, I mean, it's, it's big, it's impressive. The only thing that I can say definitively, it was easy. <laughs> they didn't do it because it was hard. You, you know what I mean? How do you, if you are Marco... You are the leader of the community, right? And you are going to convince them that building that is a good idea. Forget about feeding your family. Forget about defending yourself from the wild beast of the jungle and surviving the night and, and sickness and digging wells and all of the stuff that you got to do to survive because that's what life was about back then, survival. And you're going to you know, peel everybody away from that and build and, and quarry and move and build this wall, you're going to have to convince them to do it. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously the wall was built. So I don't think it was built out of, you know what I mean? Out of against somebody's will or threats or, you know, that it was, no, I think it was easy. I just don't know why. I think there was definitely a sense of purpose uh, as to why they needed uh, to do that, why they had to do that, like build these structures, how they did it in the specific location where, where they built it. They were clearly trying to accomplish something. Uh, this is a, a point uh, that I also bring up in my book, uh, that it's as if uh, that uh, civilization was in a way trying to recreate something that had been destroyed, as if uh, they were just like rebuilding their civilization, as if they were rebuilding something that existed before. And that was uh, somehow, and for reasons that we don't entirely understand, essential to the very survival of that civilization. So uh, there was a, a purpose, and they do firmly believe that there was a reason why they built these structures, why they built them the way they are, that goes beyond uh, just uh, um, glorifying a certain king uh, or, let's say, just some megalomaniac project. Uh, uh, I think these structures serve the purpose that we no longer understand. A megalithic built by a megalomaniac. <laughs> Everything is mega. Now, I have heard, uh, now I'm going to be in Machu Picchu in a couple of months. I cannot wait, right? And I have been told what to look out for and that there is evidence there that Machu Picchu was also built on top mm -hmm. of an, an, an ancient uh, complex. Right. You have exactly the same three layers of constructions they just described for Cusco. So you have the very old monolithic, um, where you, for instance, in Machu Picchu, you have 
the so-called temple of the three windows, which is this massive uh, megalithic structure, looks quite unlike anything else uh, at the side, it looks much older. Uh, it's built with even larger stone blocks. You have these monolithic rock cut structures on the very summit of the site. Then you have uh, polygonal structures, uh, which uh, are built with these uh, perfectly interlocking stone blocks. And then you have the Inca buildings. And in many places, you can see literally a wall that has all the three layers of construction. So it starts off as megalithic or a monolithic. Um, then you have these polygonal, perfectly interlocking stone blocks. And then right on top, you have the Inca construction, which is built of much smaller stones. And uh, Machu Picchu, I think, is a great site just to see these uh, different uh, layers, all the stratification of cultures that happen mm -hmm. in that part of the world. Yeah, the different techniques, uh, you know, stacked up on top of each other. And I have mm -hmm. heard that the state employees, right, the tour guides that are there will not discuss that, that this is purely an Incan site and that's it. There's nothing else to discuss. I think that's uh, that's uh, still the I would say the mainstream view of Machu Picchu. It was essentially built sometime around 1476 uh, by the Inca Pachacutec uh, as a sort of country state, uh, let's say for for his court. Uh, however, over the past uh, few decades, uh, uh, if not over the past few years, I think more and more evidence uh, has been brought up to show that Machu Picchu already existed long before in the time of the Incas, some pre-Inca culture actually began construction at Machu Picchu and that uh, the site was then pretty expanded and maybe fortified during the Inca period, but essentially Incas inherited an already existing megalithic citadel, a megalithic site, and uh, they built over it in a way they adapted it uh, for, for their needs. Now, they only occupied it for about 100 years, right? Yes. Which is, which is the paradox about the Incas, uh, because you have all these uh, probably hundreds of, uh, of structures. Uh, um, I think if you probably sum up the extent of, and uh, you, you were mentioning the Maya roads, these 10,000 kilometers of Maya road, but it's a similar case in South America. You have thousands and thousands of kilometers of roads. You have probably hundreds of kilometers of polygonal walls of megalithic structures. And to believe that all of that was built in less than 100 years, so by relatively newcomers, as were the Incas, I think it's uh, um, it's it's quite difficult to to believe, particularly in a part of the world like Peru, where we know for a fact that civilization stretches back almost seven thousand years. Now, um, uh, can we talk about the the tunnels in Milta? Yeah, at, at Mitla. Yes. Can I say Milta? <laughs> I, mean, I was thinking milkshake. I was thinking meat <laughs> Well, it sounds uh, sounds a little bit like Malta. Malta, uh, yeah, Malta, malted milkshakes. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, in so, in uh, <laughs> that's what you know. That's the trouble I get for not taking notes. I I I brag all the time, Marco, that I have no notes. I don't take notes. I don't have questions prepared. I know my stuff. You know, I brag about this. And then I say meat lot. <laughs> Yes. Well, there are two archaeological sites in, uh, in Mesoamerica that literally blow my mind. Uh, and this is where I've been conducting most of my research. One is Midland, the other one is San Miguel Ixtapa. And maybe we can talk also about the second site. But let me start with Mitla. Uh, Mitla is an archaeological site uh, which is located in the state of Oaxaca, so in southeastern Mexico. Uh, it's a very important archaeological site. Uh, it's visited by thousands of tourists every year. If you've never been there, I highly recommend you go and visit the site. It's some of the most impressive Mesoamerican ruins in all of Mexico. You have these beautifully preserved ancient palaces with very intricate stonework decoration, uh, beautiful uh, murals, uh, ornamentation. Uh, it's a, one of the most fascinating sites in all of Mexico. However, what is really interesting to me about Mitla is what lies underneath the site, as there is evidence of a very extensive network of underground chambers and passageways uh, that may extend for miles, literally, under the site. 
Uh, last year, my team, uh, uh, the research association that represent the Arcs Association, we conducted a geophysical study of the site of Mitla, employing state-of-the-art geophysical methods, including ground penetrating radar, electrical resistivity tomography, and seismic scans, to well, literally see underneath, uh, to see below the ground, and uh, try to confirm the existence of these tunnels of these subterranean chambers. And uh, what we found is uh, evidence of uh, very large chambers located at a very great depth underneath the site. We documented uh, with geophysical methods one massive chamber measuring about 15 by 10 meters located at a depth of around 6 meters or 18 feet below the church of Mitla. It's a, it's a big room. That's a very big room. That's a very yeah. big room. And a second chamber underneath that, which is located at a depth of 18 meters below the ground, it's almost 60 feet below the ground. So picture that it's almost a six story building below the ground, which is probably even larger, that actually extends beyond the area covered beyond the range of uh, the geophysical instruments uh, that uh, we employed in that first stage. And that confirms uh, various ancient and colonial accounts of Mitla that speak of an extensive underground labyrinth form of various subterranean chambers, all interconnected, that in turn gave access uh, to a huge subterranean cavern, which was believed uh, by the ancient Zapotecs uh, to be quite literally an entrance into the underworld what they call Lioba. Uh, and we now have reason to believe that what the geophysical scan confirmed exists under the church is just that. It's a set of underground chambers connected to a huge void, which could be a natural cavern, but we don't know for certain. It could also be another artificial chamber located under the site. And what these early accounts state is that this underground labyrinth extends for miles all under the site. This is what now we're um, going to confirm uh, in the, this month, actually in September, we're going to be down in Mitla again for a second season of the project in which we're going to extend the perimeter of uh, research, we're going to conduct more in-depth geophysical scans to confirm the true extent of these underground chambers, of these passageways, in preparation for a third phase in which we'll hopefully drill and be able to drill into these chambers and see what is actually there. Uh, what do you have to go through? Permits, permission. Yes, yes. So all of these uh, was done with permits uh, from the Mexican National Institute of History and Anthropology. The project itself was a collaboration between the Mexican, uh, as I said, the Mexican National Institute of History and Anthropology, the National Autonomous University of Mexico, and the ARCS Foundation that uh, I represent with the ARCS Foundation providing most of the funding and the logistics support uh, for the project. It was done uh, with uh, the full supervision, uh, with all the permits, uh, all the authorizations from the local authorities. And, uh, how do you how do you fund the foundation? <laughs> I mean, this is, this is, archaeology is not cheap. No, it's it's very expensive work. Uh, um, last year, we started a fundraiser. We started another fundraiser. This year, we've been able to actually uh, gather uh, quite a bit of funding through private donors. Uh, but we also did, and it was a, um, something that I particularly pushed for, doing a public uh, crowdfunding campaign, a public fundraiser, because we do believe that the public has a right to know the public has a right to access the findings and is the only way to make sure that the public can have access to the results of these scans to the research reports is by allowing the public to also participate in funding these research and that's why we have launched a public fundraiser which is still currently open you can find all the links on our website if you want to, to contribute and we are committed to making all all the research findings available to all of our supporters and donors. Now, what 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 would happen? I'm not being facetious. I'm speaking very frank. What would happen? You're you're down there. You find the tunnel. You you go in. 
and you look up and there's on the wall is a map of Atlantis, <laughs> or you look up on the wall and there's a Templar cross, right? Or you go yep. into there's the the uh, the Ark of the Covenant, right? You, you, mm-hmm. you find the body of Jesus, whatever. Uh, hieroglyphics, Egyptian hieroglyphics on the wall. What would happen? Do you think that that would be suppressed, or you would be able to go public? I, 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 so that that that's the thing that I get asked uh, very often whether I believe in those archaeological cover-ups. I, I don't believe in that. Uh, I think there are some cases in which, uh, yes, there are archaeologists or various academics uh, because of, uh, um, let's say, essentially opportunistic reasons, they may want to suppress a certain, certain research, but they do not believe uh, in any large-scale cover-up. Actually, pretty much all the archaeologists, and I've worked with a lot of archaeologists in Mexico, with scientists, uh, geophysical scientists, uh, geologists, they're extremely open-minded uh, as to what we may find. Um, all the screening process with the National Institute of Anthropology has been extremely open, extremely transparent. And so, at least, at least in my experience, as far as I can speak from experience, if there is any cover up to hide or conceal the truth about our past, I've, I've, I've yet to see any evidence of that. Well, you say that now. <laughs> you have, you that have may change. Have, you can ask me the yeah, same question two months from now, and maybe now, I will I, have a different answer. And so let's, let's go back to the question, though. Um, mm-hmm. And I understand. You, Okay, I understand your answer, but let's go back to the question. Mm-hmm. What do you think would happen if you did find something like that? Mm-hmm. Would you be allowed? Would you be, I mean, Atlantis, right? I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. You think you think it's a tough road now? Go and reveal something like that. And, and, okay. and. Think about which uh, which archaeologists wouldn't want to have such a discovery published. I think uh, you would have archaeologists fighting uh, each other to be the first to publish something like this. Uh, mm. Go talk to Robert Schock. Go talk to Robert Schock. When he would he did all of the analysis right on mm-hmm. the Great Sphinx, the chamber there. And the water erosion and the last time water was there in Giza and had all of the proof and laid everything out. Look, look, you would think that that kind of discovery would be, the, you know, a new dating of the Sphinx that goes back to 10,000 BC. Mm-hmm. That changes everything. And if you remember and talk about cover up. When he went public with that in 1992 in San Diego at the convention there, the geologist mm-hmm. convention, and he goes public with all of his information and the 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 movie, the documentary mm-hmm. comes out and, yep. and everything. He wrote all those things. Yeah, yeah. What he was told then was nothing before 3000 mm-hmm. B.C. And if you find something before 3000 B.C., Come talk to us. We'll have a conversation. What happened three years later? Klaus Schmidt, go Beckley Tepe. Mm-hmm. It wasn't before. It was 7,000 years before. But even that wasn't good enough to change the conversation. Mm-hmm. You know, and Zahi Haiwas, you know, a couple of years ago in that video with Graham Hancock, He's literally, Zahi Haiwas is looking at Graham Hancock in his eyeballs going, I've never heard of the Skobekli Tepe that you speak about. What is what these, the Skobekli Tepe? Yeah. You know, and th- so, yeah, I, no, I think the cover-up is real. And I don't think well, it's think an easy the, road. I think Egyptology is a very politicized uh, field. Uh, uh, of course, like you have some very big egos uh, that are playing in the, in the field of... Uh, of Egyptology, but but again, you you mentioned Robert Shock. Uh, he was still able to publish his findings. Uh, he's still a professor at Boston University, so it's hard for me to argue that uh, it was really a cover up. Yes, maybe he didn't get the funding they would have got uh, if he aligned with the mainstream view. I think it, it all boils down to a question of funding. At the end, no, he got so hammered, man. He got <laughs> hammered. 
um, uh, you know, he's he's a good friend of mine, and I was uh, I've been with him uh, a few times now this year. Mm-hmm. And a few months ago, we were here in, in Southern California, and uh, I had a private conference. And he said, man, Jimmy, you have no idea what I went through and mm-hmm. the price that I paid both professionally and my family and the ridicule and the teasing and the the absolute suppression mm-hmm. of this. It has been the worst. I, 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 anybody else would have given up a long time ago. Yep. And it, it's been that hard of a road. So, No. You know, it, was he allowed to? Yeah, sure. Yeah, he's still a professor at Boston University, but it wasn't like he's being treated like he discovered King Tut's tomb, right? You know, well, he's, or think Machu the, Picchu. No, it's not the case, right? I think it comes down to standards of evidence, now, because I, as much as I admire Robert Schuck's research, I think he's fundamentally right in many of his. Uh, uh, hypothesis at the same time that remains a hypothesis you know, like the water erosion of the Sphinx it's still very controversial you have many papers that have been published by other researchers that are equally as qualified as Robert Schock that uh, reach opposite conclusions so I think it's still a debated issue now what you're talking about uh, like finding a map of Atlantis scratch on a, wall, on a wall or finding an ancient machine in a tunnel that's not debatable that's hard evidence so I think it's a very different standard of evidence we're talking about uh, now the question is uh, will we ever be able to find that kind of evidence that will be so irrefutable so uncontestable that the entire academic community will just say yes we were wrong all along uh <laughs> right <laughs> possible but unlikely possible, possible but, unlikely. but unlikely do you think the let's i know it's it's not exactly in your wheelhouse but i'm sure you thought about this do you think the ark of the covenant has been found <laughs> I, I I can tell you what I think personally. Uh, the answer is yes, sir. Uh, but again, that's that's my personal belief. Uh, this is a subject uh, um, that's also been uh, uh, a personal interest of of mine. Uh, I've been reading since uh, Graham Hancock's uh, research on the Ark of the Covenant at Aksum in Ethiopia. Um, people claiming. Uh, to have located the Ark of the Covenant in Jerusalem. Um, I, th- I think this is actually one artifact where I see the possibility of an archaeological cover-up, just because of the not only the historical significance, but religious significance of that. What if you find the Ark of the Covenant and it's empty, or there is uh, like something that would... Uh, uh, undermine the very foundations of Christianity or Judaism. So I, I do see why people would uh, want to keep something like that hidden and concealed. The, the you know what I, this is my problem. And by the way, that first mm-hmm. documentary that Graham made on the Ark, um, he was still like a writer for some British magazine or something back then. He wasn't. Graham Hancock that we have today, but that's a brilliant documentary, you know, him chasing this thing down. But I have a really hard time looking at that temple in Axum and that one priest, Mm -hmm. right? The, 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 The Ark of the Covenant is guarded by that dude, right? One guy, not an army. I'm pretty not sure a that's a copy. I'm pretty sure that's a copy. Right, of right, right. That church. I have a yeah, hard time with that. Italian. Yeah. Now, it may be in Ethiopia, but it, it's not in that temple. Mm-hmm. And and that old dude, right? <laughs> oh, look, uh, Aksum is a very fascinating site. It's a megalithic site uh, as well. You have this massive sure. obelisk. Uh, you have evidence of tunnels, subterranean chambers. There's probably a maze of tunnels underneath that site. So uh, I, I, I do not think that what he, whatever is on display in that church uh, in, in Aksum in Samaria of Zion is the actual Ark of the Covenant. But I do think it's possible the Ark of the Covenant is somewhere in Aksum or in Ethiopia. Yeah, it, it's possible. It, it, it may be here in North America, too. I don't know. It could be in England. It could be in Scotland. Could in a big be, Air know. Force base. Uh, Man, Among, sure, uh, thousands other crates like an Indiana Jones movie. I, I don't have I don't have any problems with that. I, I, it also may be buried in under rubble under King Solomon's yeah. temple. You know, it, it, yeah. it may have never even left Jerusalem. Yeah. 
So uh, the um, uh, the other part of this, when we talk about Atlantis, which we you know did last year when you're on the show, that was an excellent show, by the way. Um, is it is it something as simple as that culture from Atlantis uh, to some degree survived in very small numbers and is responsible for the the jump that cultures made around the world? It doesn't matter if we're talking about the Far East, the Near East, the Middle East, Northern Europe, Eastern, Western Europe, or or North and South and Central America, that Atlantis could be tied to everything? Yeah, I do, I do believe that's exactly what happened. And this is also a thesis that I present in, in my book. It was survivors from this lost civilization that were responsible for restarting a civilization in the aftermath of these uh, devastating cataclysm. There was the Younger Dryas at the end of the last Ice Age. There was a, a really... Um, like civilization ending event uh, and survivors from that civilization were somehow able to restart a new cycle of civilization by teaching uh, the primitive people, by teaching the survivors once again the arts of civilization, starting from uh, the very fundamentals of uh, agriculture and then moving on to the more advanced uh, knowledge of astronomy, mathematics, uh, engineering. And that's, that's the paradox uh, of... Uh, uh, cultures that uh, are in all other aspects uh, seemingly very primitive, but at the same time possess extremely advanced uh, knowledge uh, in uh, fields that are entirely unrelated to basic survival. You were mentioning why would a civilization is just uh, struggling to survive uh, until the next day need to have such a precise knowledge of uh, astronomy, of processions to be able to measure these very long cycles of time. Or think about the early Mayas where they introduced the concept of the zero. They were able to count in millions of years. They had algorithms uh, that allowed them to predict the eclipses or to calculate the time of eclipses at uh, tens or thousands of years in the past. Uh, why would a civilization that for as far as we know was essentially um, an, a still agrarian society was just coming out of prehistory need that type of knowledge? How did that knowledge come to them? And I think in many of these cases, not in all cases, but in many of these cases, the answer is that they inherited that knowledge from a far more advanced, uh, older civilization. Yeah, it, it's it's fascinating to think that they were able to contemplate, to think about and document thousands of years forward and backwards. Mm -hmm. We don't do that now. We don't. We barely look at next week. Which is, which, which is again the paradox. I think uh, this one is a paradox. Yeah, most yeah. incredible paradoxes of Mesoamerican civilization. On the one hand, that you have this extremely advanced science. Uh, they were they probably had the most advanced mathematics of any ancient civilization. Um, again, they had uh, a numerical system that allowed them to count in millions. They introduced the concept of zero. Uh, the the Maya calendar, or what we call it, the Maya calendar, but in fact we know it's much older than the Mayas. It was already developed by the Old and then the Omex probably inherited it from someone else. Is this extremely sophisticated computer? The only way we have to picture that is uh, as a series of uh, uh, spinning cogs and wheels. Almost, it's almost like a mechanical machine. It's uh, like the representation of a mechanical computer in a, in a way. And to think that uh, all that science uh, existed uh, side by side with things like human sacrifice. Uh, for instance, or the fact that a civilization that possessed such a sophisticated calendar of mathematics never developed even a system of weights and measures, uh, something so basic to civilization. Mm -hmm. I think these are some of the paradoxes of, uh, of, of Maya civilization, or Mesoamerican civilization in general, or they never knew the metals, for instance. Uh, well, they did know copper and gold, but it never got to iron, for instance, at least as far as we know. So this is, a, I think, like paradoxical to have civilizations that are clearly so advanced in certain fields, but completely ignorant or entirely primitive in others. Yeah. No wheel, for instance. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. No wheel. And uh, apparently, 
And and now here is uh, wh- one last one last question and point uh, before I say goodnight. Fantastic show, Marco. Great to have you back on with us. Um, is that if we look at anthropology in general, they will state quite clearly that us, Homo sapiens sapiens, mo- modern humans, between 150,000 and 200,000 years. Right. Okay. That's that's the dating we are given. But what doesn't match up with that is the uh, the Darwinian side of this and the amount of time that it takes to evolve and evolution in general. Right. And if we push back these dates to 10,000, 20,000 years ago, then that means that human homo sapien sapien is obviously much older than what we are taught in in schools today so again that is a paradox you can't have both situations exist at the same time Mm -hmm. it seems that we had an older evolved modern technical human civilization that predates everything that we're we're taught yeah, yeah, and I think um, we need to think in terms of cycles of civilization. Now, this idea of linear time, of linear revolution of civilization, that's a relatively modern concept. Because the ancient society, they used to think in terms of cyclical time. And uh, actually, if you look back, uh, and I'm not talking about uh, the last 100,000 years, if you just look back at the past 2,000 years, think about what happened in Europe after the fall of the Roman Empire with the Dark Ages, uh, what happened in, in Mesoamerica with the fall of this great great Maya cities. Uh, one day you had cities inhabited by hundreds of thousands of people, and then within just a few decades, all these places were abandoned, uh, left to rot in the jungle, same that happened in Cambodia, for instance. So if you actually look back at the whole pattern of human civilization, it's a pattern of uh, rise and fall of civilization. It's never a linear progression. Um, you always see like great civilization flourishing for a while, then collapsing civilization, always uh, restarting again from, from the ashes, maybe in different forms. Now, if you project that over the entire timeline of human evolution, it becomes entirely possible that uh, um, an older civilization, even a very advanced civilization, may have existed in remote antiquity. It collapsed and humanity, human civilization, is to start over again, uh, literally from the Stone Age, before everything else got um, got. Uh, uh, before before we basically invented uh, again civilization. If if we had some crazy EMP, right? <laughs> something so, you know, some oh. celestial thing, kind of like the younger dryers, right? If we had some kind of EMP, something that neutralized electronics, right? Mm-hmm. right that we would would go be back, back to the, the Stone Age. Yeah, sure. yeah, it, sure. it, immediately. I don't even know how long it would take, you know, because we have built our modern society on the backs of everything, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. It's just it's just band-aid after band-aid after right. band-aid, and that's how we've gotten here. Yeah. That's fine. That's where we are. But if you erase that, mm-hmm. can you imagine how long it would take? <laughs> it would. It wouldn't be a hundred years. Yep, and there is would... so much, uh, so much interdependency. I think we have this idea that the more advanced civilization is, the more stable it is. We almost have this. Uh, I think it's a it's a false impression that our civilization is essentially invincible. It could never happen to us. They would just get wiped out, and we have to restart from the Stone Age. Because look at us, we're so advanced, we're so technological. Certainly, we could never go back to be just like primitive covered in skin. So, uh, but think about the interdependencies. Uh, if uh, any one of us uh, would uh, be shipwrecked on a desert island, uh, would any of us uh, be able to create uh, a light bulb? Uh, let's not even talk about the computer. Forget about this. Forget about that. Forget that would never, that would that. That. You know, you know, if you, you raise a good point, you and I, you're a smart guy, Marco. You're a smart guy. Where'd you go? You went to Harvard, right? Yes. You went to Harvard, right? I didn't, but I, I, I'm, 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 I got, I got street smarts. But let's say you and I both know what this is, right? We know, we know what this is. We know what we can. We know the ideas behind it. An app, software, whatever, and, and then mechanical. We understand this. 
But if you and I are in a desert island, this would never happen mm-hmm. for ten thousand years. Right. <laughs> it would never. Right. It would never just, happen. But even even think about even simpler things. Uh, just think about how interconnected our global supply chains are. Even something yeah, is, uh, is apparently easy as just smelting iron, for instance. You need to find the iron ore. You need to build a furnace for smelting it. You need to find coal to achieve the right temperature. Where do you get that if you're just stranded? No, you and I would. Island? You and I would starve to death. <laughs> I'm sure of that. I'm sure of that. I mean, it's it's really true. But yeah. we know, we understand, we know refrigeration. We understand uh, viruses and what they can do and infection. We understand that. But you and I aren't going to come up with antibiotics anytime soon. No, we're gonna we're gonna die on that island. We're not gonna reinvent civilization. And all that is going to be left are probably like, if we, if we survive, we don't starve to death. Uh, there are probably going to be just the stories uh, that we tell our children, our grandchildren, about how people used to have flying machines and little devices uh, that could tell you the news or you could call long distance. And it would feel like magic to them. Uh, maybe in a thousand years or 10,000 years, nobody would even believe that. No, 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 no. And, and, and forget about this. Mm-hmm. How about... How about growing cotton and weaving some right. clothes? Right. right? That's, 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 that's And that's what I'm saying. You know, civilization has just been built on Band-Aids, you know, forever. And if anything happened at this point, oof, uh, right? And so we would be, we would be what they would be talking about in 100,000 years. Right. You know, 100,000 years ago, there's a possibility that there was an advanced civilization. <laughs> And that I, I existed. Think, uh, you bring up a really good point because I think that the ultimate evidence, uh, if you have, if you were to ask me, what is the smoking gun for that civilization, will point exactly to agriculture. So, uh, just think about what would be the first uh, thing that would come to mind to the survivors. Just restart a stable food supply. Just basic survival. So it's you would domesticate obvious. wheat. That's what you would do. Well, they, they already had domesticated wheat, right? Because uh, um, wheat, uh, because if they were an advanced civilization, they clearly must have had some form of agriculture. So what we That's right. consider to be the agricultural revolution was essentially agriculture being reintroduced, uh, probably with a different environment. So there required still a lot of adaptation. It may not have been the same type of seeds, the same type of plants existed before. But if you look at how wheat, uh, how corn, and uh, rice were domesticated, the amount of genetic engineering that goes into that uh, is just mind-blowing. I don't think that even with our modern science would be able to create anything like domesticated wheat. And there have been dozens of studies, and uh, this is still an open question. I think it's probably one of the most important open questions in science, how exactly those crops uh, upon which our entire civilization, our entire uh, society depends were first domesticated. And uh, you would not find a single clear answer as to how exactly that was done and uh, as to why that only happened once over the entire course of human history. And it was never repeated again. Yeah. See, this is why this is why they keep me away from universities. <laughs> because let me let me be very clear here, Marco. I cannot imagine with the way that we are taught some dude out on the Serengeti mm-hmm. right, and he, tigers and lions and whatever, right? Wilderbeast, <laughs> wild mm-hmm. boars are shredding his family apart. And his wife is like, dude, will you come over here and, and, and help your family out? No, um, I got this idea about wheat. Right. I'm working right, on think it. About, uh, no, it. No, it didn't happen. No, it did not. It just did not happen that way. There's no way that Stone Age man, pre Neolithic, right, is <laughs> yeah. out there domesticating wheat. 
No, I'm not, not. a wonderful quote uh, from uh, from Graham Henko. Okay, I think it's from one of his latest books, uh, Supernatural, that talks about uh, the domestication of plants uh, in in the Amazon, where he makes this uh, this analogy. I think he's talking about the domestication of the potato, like something something very basic, like it's such a common uh, food staple. And uh, what he says is that the amount of genetic recombination that went into making uh, basically an edible root. Uh, into what is the potato today is equivalent to assuming that uh, a tornado will randomly pick up together pieces from the ground and build a 747. That That's just it. doesn't it's happen. It's the same anymore. thing. And no, no, not a 747. A starship to <laughs> Mars. <laughs> right. Right. Marco, thank you so much, my friend. Where can everybody follow you and, and stay updated? Yes. Yeah, so, so I have my website. Uh, it's uh, marcovigato.com. Uh, there you can find links to my books, uh, to my research. Uh, I also mentioned uh, the research foundation that Elida in Mexico, it's called the Arx Foundation. You can find us on uh, arxproject.org there you will find uh, the latest research uh, in Mexico, in Mesoamerica uh, hopefully uh, some of you will uh, decide to support uh, our research, we have an open fundraiser if you want to contribute to our research in Mitla and other parts of Mexico and help us uh, reveal more of the true origins of civilization yeah man, good luck, keep me posted on that and, uh, and I can make arrangements if you want to go dig up if you want to go dig up some aliens, uh, I, I, I would can love make that to. Happen. I would love to. No, I, I think you need to be involved. Okay, so I've got the direct connection, and I I need I would, somebody like you to go down there. I would and, be and, the the uh, happiest person in the world to be proven wrong uh, that these are genuine <laughs> artifacts. So I'll talk to you, Marco. Behave and be well, my friend. Now, don't forget tomorrow, two o'clock Pacific time is the uh, UFO hearing that's going on in Mexico. I am going to broadcast live here tomorrow uh, with Christina Gomez. So I'll see everybody tomorrow for the UFO hearing. Tonight, I'm saying good night to Marco Vigato. Thank you so much, Marco. You're the Thank very you, best, man. It was a great, pleasure. Con great conversation. Thank you so much. And I just ran over tonight, everybody, but it's Marco, and uh, it was a great conversation. So I am going to get out of here. I'll see everybody tomorrow right here with uh, Christina Gomez. So we're going to simulcast. We'll do it from here, and we'll do it from her channel, too, as well. All right? All right. I'll see everybody tomorrow. And uh, there you go. Fade to Black is produced by Hilton J. Palm. Renee Newman and Michelle Freed. And uh, you know what's really funny? My computer just went blank right in front of me. It did. It went, it just went blank. It did. So I'm gonna go from memory. Thank you to Dennis and Kevin. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music Doug Aldridge. Intro Space Boy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network. This broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2023 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. I'll see everybody tomorrow at 2 p.m. with Christina Gomez. Until then, go back, Lee Tappy.